All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining me this morning. And uh, I hope that everybody has had themselves a wonderful uh, break over the holidays. That went very quickly. Um, and now we're back at it. And uh, it's kind of nice when we have a break and we come back, we're into lesson six, which is traditionally, you know, it's a fairly straightforward and, and easy assignment. So um, congratulations to all of you for we're plowing through uh, lesson number five. And um, I see that uh, there's a number of you that have turned in uh, assignments over the break, and I will be getting to those. Um, I'll be getting some of them today, um, but certainly through the week, I'll, I'll uh, plow through those. So thank you very much for, for all your hard work there. Okay, so let me just which screen here and we will take a look at the soil jar test assignment all right and just before i do that i am hearing somebody's background here so i will i may uh, try and mute everybody All right, there we go. Okay. No. <laughs> Sorry about that. There we go. There we are. Excellent. Okay, so yeah, uh, lesson number six, um, again, it's going to be pretty straightforward. We're doing a couple of steps here. First, we're going to look at um, the USD soil web survey map, and that can be a little bit tricky. So there is a tutorial right here, right below this link. So I... Uh, advise everybody if you're having trouble with this website to go through the tutorial and it is it's straightforward once you've uh, seen it, how it's done but <clears throat> this is a fantastic resource for all those in the u.s um up in canada here certainly in british columbia we have an excellent um soil database as well but uh, i would say the usda um site is is quite something um, a lot of really good data there and uh if you're in an urban area of course it's going to be um you know whenever we develop uh spaces there is disruption so you may find that it doesn't align uh, too well with the survey that's online here but it's great so we want to go through this and get an idea of of the soils that are um, supposedly in your area. And then we're gonna take a jar test uh, and then we're going to compare the two. So I must say when we are doing um, not so much urban designs because they're pretty predictable where I live. Uh, when we have small uh, spaces, you end up we're, we're pretty much sandy low most of the time. But when we get into acreage uh, designs, we often use uh, <clears throat> British Columbia's equivalent to the soil survey as a starting point. So it's really a, valu a valuable tool for sure. Uh, and again, I won't go through the tutorial with you because uh, the link is here and... Um, Again, it is pretty straightforward. The, the trick here is you have to define your area of interest. And that's where some people get um, uh, confused. Um, and I get it. It's uh, often with these government-based um, websites, it can be a little bit tricky. So that is, just get my chat open here, sorry. 
make sure I don't miss any questions. Okay. Yeah, so that's a pretty straightforward first part. And then we have the actual soil test. And again, there's some instructions here that you can go through. And um, again, it's a very basic test. Uh, you can, <clears throat> it does give you a good idea of the texture though. And that is a valuable thing to know going forward. Um, if you want to, if you were doing a project and you wanted a little more detail, then you could get a traditional soil test, or you could also look at a soil food web uh, test as well. And I can um, just show you that. And these are very interesting. I, I've taken Dr. Elaine Ingham's courses, and I was going to go that uh, soil food web consultant route, but I didn't. And um, what um, I find fascinating with this end, and it's it's kind of resonates with the work I've done and how I was trained uh, initially it was all about cultivating the soil and not plants. And uh, as I learned more and more and dived into the soil food web, you realize that you know all the nutrients that our plants uh, are looking for and end up drawing up from the soil, um, it's soil organisms that are responsible for uh, creating that. So, this is definitely a worthwhile step to take if you're serious about trying to um, dive a little bit deeper into um, the, the actual life within the soil of your project site. And you can see all there's lots of labs through the US and Canada and Europe. Um, and basically what they do, it's not very expensive. Um, you basically take a, a soil sample, you send it into a lab, but you want it to be quite close to where you are uh, living or sending it from. And um, they will take a look at what's living, what organisms are alive within your sample. And they'll look at what you're trying to achieve with that specific area. And they'll provide you with some recommendations in terms of shifting um, the conditions to encourage whatever types of organisms uh, you need to, in order to optimize the crop you're growing. So again, it's really uh, a very useful exercise uh, to go through. And um, one of the reasons I didn't pursue this is I, I just don't like uh, using the microscope. So I know it kind of sounds kind of funny, but uh, I didn't see myself looking through a microscope all day. But you can see there's a lot of different labs up and down the coast here and certainly worth uh, taking a look at. Um, yeah, lots of instructional videos there. And then the, uh, the whole idea here is we're putting our sample in. Uh, we'd want to take out any big rocks, you know, that are, are obvious rocks or, or big twigs and stuff. But you just agitate that. And this is all going to settle out into uh, sand, silt, and clay. And the sand's the heaviest, so it's going to be the first to hit the bottom of the jar. And then the silt and then the clay, which has very, very small, fine particulates, takes a lot longer to settle. So that, hence you get a nice uh, layered effect. Now, the challenge uh, with for, for all of you is actually, <laughs> it's uh, well, it's not so much a challenge. It's, I find it just very difficult to get a good photograph of a jar. You have to have the lighting you have to have some kind of lighting projecting onto the jar itself in order to see these distinct layers. Now, if you're not able to do that, no worries. But if you want um, some feed, you know, if you're not completely sure with what you're looking at and you want some feedback from me on that, um, just try and get as, as clear an image as you can. 
And uh, so then we go to the analysis. So we're just going to look at those three samples and we're going to compare it, how that uh, lines up with um, soil wood food, or sorry, <laughs> the USDA uh, soil map. Uh, and then we're also going to look at, <clears throat> have some good questions here. What, what local materials can we use to build more soil? Uh, and what are some of the limiting factors? So you may find with your infiltration tests, your percolation tests, that, that you might have like sandy loam that is really inherently fast draining, but maybe your holes are, are you know, draining very slowly, right? So you kind of scratch your head over that. And that's often caused by uh, compaction, right? And that can come from any number of uh, sources that could be from simp simple from uh, equipment use. Uh, it could be on larger, um, larger scale. Uh, say it's a farm, it could be from livestock, right? Um, and if you have bare soil, it could actually be from rainfall. So rainfall is a very harmful element when it's hitting uh, bare soil. So that's kind of a, a quick snapshot of um, the assignment here and what we're looking for. There's also some resources. So <clears throat> again, if you're inside uh, the U United States, you've got uh, some great resources and here's a link for any of those people that are in BC. I'm not sure if we, I think there's one student here from British Columbia. Um, not positive on that, but anyhow, there's all these links here. So if you're outside of North America, then it gets a little trickier. Um, your, your, your survey is gonna be a little more general. Um, and then we have our rubric here. So that again is an important thing to look at when you're putting your assignment together. Uh, Cause again, this is what I use when I grade. So just make sure that you've included what is asked for and uh, you will most likely do very well. So that's sort of a, a very quick snapshot of the soil uh, jar test and that whole assignment. Um, does anybody have any questions they want to ask about that? You can unmute yourself or I'll certainly put a question in the chat here. We also have our Q&A document. I have I have a couple questions, but I also want to hold space for others that might want to ask questions too. Okay, well, you go ahead, Nancy. Okay, um, one of them is that when I did the soil percolation test, one of my three sites, um, the water was almost just still standing there after an hour, whereas another site it had completely drained in an hour. Right. And it doesn't have the compaction issues that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. but th um, this was the site that I mentioned is like a, a, a hollow, an area that just gets deeper and deeper. It's about three feet deep. I just measured it this weekend. Um, and we're, is there any chance that we may have groundwater close to the surface there? Oh, sure. Yeah. Could that, could it, could it be that the soil is just so saturated that right. it's not draining. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, at this time of year, you probably find on a lot of uh, a lot of sites that that could potentially happen. Um, I know where I am. Uh, I have very porous soil. It's a, a sandy loam, but there is one part of our part of our property where we have a little spring that comes out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there you go when we get, and, and it runs almost all year, mm -hmm. um, but at varying levels. So there's a lot that's going on below ground that we're not 
always completely aware of, Nancy. So you may have some groundwater there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that would affect your test. And that gives you a lot of some valuable information, right? You can mm -hmm. use that in your, uh, in your favor, right? Did you have a sense of how I could use it in my favor? Um, well, I, um, I, I can't, um, let's say with any certainty, because I haven't really <laughs> dove into your site, uh, at this time to explore it. Right. But, uh, I do know that we are working on, um, a, a sort of a acreage homestead right now. And they have a, a funny part of their property where a lot of water if they're in their, their micro watershed, uh, which they're picking up from neighboring properties, it, it consolidates on one part of their property and it's a low point. And uh, we're going to, we're going to, we, what we have proposed there is we are going to put in a uh, perforated catch basin and uh, we're going to pump out of that into a holding pond during the winter months uh. for their livestock. So that is um, one way you can, um, <clears throat> we're not trying to drain the area. We're just trying to pull what we can from it. If that, if that makes sense. And we wouldn't, you know, that's not something that we would do during the growing season. That's so that'd be like right now, we'd be trying to fill storage. Well, that is quite high. And then during the growing season, their water, their groundwater drops, um, probably three, four, five feet. It's quite substantial. Uh, then we, we don't have access to it, but we will have a bunch of water, a couple hundred thousand gallons stored. So that's one way you could, could look at it. Um, there are a lot of different ways, a lot of, you know, it, it's, it's not, um, a question that's easily answered without going through a lot of, you know, really diving into the, the drawing itself and getting to know the site. Uh, but I, I'm always looking to store, uh, particularly where we live, where we have long periods of dry weather. Um, the other option is trying to uh, I, I guess it depends what your uh, objectives are. Um, if that's an area you want to utilize and you find is it spongy when you go out there at this time of year? It is actually, yeah. and the ground around it, it's like a crater is what it looks like. And it mm -hmm. used to be left level years ago, but it's mm -hmm. like a crater and the ground is literally cracking into it more mm -hmm. and more as, as time goes on. Interesting. Is, um, yeah, sometimes you, that can happen if you have debris that was buried that is decomposing. Uh, it really does depend on how the site was prepared. Cause I have seen that I've seen people bury woody debris and it, that's a great thing. As you know, Hugo culture, uh, uh, within the permaculture, it's, it's a wonderful approach. Um, but, uh, this is often done to save money, <laughs> bury the problem rather than trying to, uh, you know, chip or burn or haul off woody debris. So you never know. Could be, there could be other reasons for it too. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, um, you never know. You might want to, if you ever had a, a machine on your property and um, did a little test hole there, I wouldn't necessarily do it at this time of year, but during the, the summer, you know, you might, um, might get an answer to that question. Thank, thank, thank you so yeah. much. Oh, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So does anybody else have any questions they want to, to throw out there? Now, we don't have to, um, certainly don't have to stay with any 
within the, the soil topic here. I'm open to chatting about um, anything you wish. I have a feeling that on our our last Q and A, our lesson five Q and A, that we were going to do some uh, further exploration uh, as far as rainwater harvesting goes, but I'm not positive about that. Um, but again, I'm open to talking about anything anybody wishes, or I can just show you a few items that we're working on. That really depends what people's uh, what works for all of you? Um, I was going to ask if this isn't too involved. I don't want to put you on the spot, but the <laughs> the measuring of the soil when when it settled down in our jars, I just want to make sure I'm doing that correctly. Um, I actually missed the clay layer. Mm -hmm. I had to look it up because I was only catching the silt and the sand. Yeah. Um, and I didn't realize how subtle that clay layer is, but it's definitely there once you know what to look for. Right. Um, and I just want to make sure I'm getting those measurements correctly of all three and then using the um, conversion chart. Sure. Uh, that the pyramid. <clears throat> Did well. you, do you have something you want me to look at or you just want to, um, Tell us how you went about that. And how, how... Let's see if I could find a picture. Um, so if you want, you can I... always paste your your document into the chat. We can open that up. That's really up okay. to you, Tabitha. Let me how see if think? I can grab a photo. Okay. Um, and then also while we're while I'm kind of waiting, um, mm -hmm. when the um, so when the water does not clear in the jar, yeah. Uh, what is that indicative of? Clay. Clay. Okay. Yeah. Lots of clay. So it could take a week, maybe more, okay. uh, to settle out very, very fine particles. Yeah. Okay. Um. So I can't just paste a photo in here, can I? Sorry, no, I very... think you have. I think you can attach a file. Okay. And then I could open it up on the send. Oh, okay. Oh, goodness me. Well, I'm going to abandon that. <laughs> <laughs> um, this okay. is going to take too long. Maybe if you guys want to move on to other questions, I'll see if I can figure that part out. Sure. Or if you even want to email it to me, can yeah. do that. Sure. Okay. And okay. then I can just open the image um, on the screen here. Sure. Um, let me see here. Maybe I could just drop my um, whole, got that whole uh, slide stock in there. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh-huh okay. okay you guys can see my work in progress okay so go to All right. So, so your question is whether you've got these proportions correct. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. And I think even more clay is continuing to settle out. It will. And, but by the looks of it, it'll be, you know, kind of minimal. Like the, okay. the actual total would be minimal. Um, oh. Yeah, I just have to get my pen and paper here. Whenever I do because something. Is, yeah. Oh, I, right. I had three areas that did not drain. I just abandoned the drain, the, the perk test. Mm -hmm. So I assumed it's 
even that amount of clay is is has quite an impact on drainage, but maybe that's more uh, the silt part. I don't know. Well, I I wouldn't necessarily put blame on the soil texture. It okay. may be um, a, a case where you've had compaction. So if we look um, at so so if we look at the picture of your mm -hmm. test hole, is it within mm -hmm. so like yeah. right at the edge here? No, Are it's right in between that big open dirt area between the okay. lawn and yeah, it's right in the middle of that. Okay, so that's been disturbed, and yes, it has. You know that <laughs> could have learned. been machinery. <laughs> it uh, was. Yeah. So there you go. Oh. <laughs> huh. So what what you often find with, um, or at least this has been my observation with machinery is you often will get a, a really compact zone. It goes down about three inches, and then there'll be relief beyond there. So, um, if you, a broad fork is an excellent tool to try and okay. alleviate that. Okay. Yeah, huh. a little bit of work, right? But I got a little bit of ground to cover there. That'll keep me busy. Oh, um, sure. I'm also oh. getting I'm getting tap rooted invasive weeds that are impossible to. Um, get out. So that's uh, that. That's interesting, um, because often when we get these dandelion type weeds, like the tap rooting, uh, they are telling us that indeed uh, we have. Uh, they're there because there's compaction. They're trying to fix okay. the problem. So this oh. is this is the kind of broad fork I have. Um, yeah. it's made by meadow creature. Now the one I okay. have is not, it was fabricated by a friend, but it's the same thing. And it's really a good tool for, uh, a, a wide variety of soil types. Uh, you'll see there are some others available, say like this that have very, uh, small tines. And this is great for Sandy market garden, you know, it's a market gardener's tool. There's no doubt about that. Um, but often the market gardeners are using it in pretty fluffy areas, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to break out um, some ground like you have there that's been compacted with machinery, this this is great because it'll go down 14 inches. So okay, this is, yeah. And the other thing <clears throat> that I have that... Um, Spell it right. No. There you go. Because I have one of these. And uh, Dickie John is uh, okay. a, a brand that's fairly cost effective. <clears throat> we bought one of these. I think when I took Dr. Elaine Ingham's courses, I realized that I needed one of these. And um, we take this to every job site. Um, okay. It's a great way for us to see, you know, if somebody says, well, this area is not performing well, you stick that mm -hmm. in. And um, what happens is it's a, it's a, you know, a very easy to use kind of analog tool. You just push it into the ground and you're getting a response here on the resistance. And okay. um, it will tell you, um, what your compaction level is. This is a bit easier. And for myself, I go for 150 PSI. That's which would be right here. Uh, this the gauge says 200 is green, but I uh, my instructions, <laughs> from Dr. Uh -huh. Lane Ingham, is 150. So okay. if it's under 150, that's great. And if it's over. We know we have some work to do. And then as you push the rod in, uh, it has increments. I believe these are three inch increments. So you can tell where your trouble spots are. Huh. Um, and we use this on our own annual vegetable area. And uh, over the years, 
Uh, now we push it in and we get, oof, just, you know, it goes down 18 inches, no problem, no resistance. So, or, or you know, acceptable resistance. Um, okay. But it makes a huge difference to how your landscape's going to respond because you can do everything you want that appears to be right. But if you have a compaction issue, um, just inhibits uh, root development. Wow. So, so if this had been a client and they had wanted the back area graded, which is why we brought a machine back there, yeah. how would you go about doing that? Because I've created well, a mess for myself. I mean, it's like, I, yeah. I can't get anything in the ground in the summer and in the winter, it's like slick and... yeah. Well, this is the time of year when it's when the soil's moist. Uh, that would be the time of year to use the broad fork. Yeah, and you'll probably find once you broad fork that area, uh -huh. um, then you can amend it, right? So, okay. when I say amend, I don't mean necessarily mixing compost or organic into that soil. Um, okay. We would traditionally plant, you know, decompact it and plant and then uh, have uh, composted mulch on the surface. But okay. there are many, many ways that you can go about doing the same thing. And some people swear by certain uh, techniques. Um, some people like to put compost in the hole. Um, the only, the only, um, sort of augmenting that we do is often we'll put in a micro uh, rise of fungal spores with our woody plantings. And we really find that that helps for quick establishment. Okay. Um, but yeah, we use machinery all the time. So, I mean, yeah. I could show you on, on uh, my property where we had a machine come in and I didn't get on it quick enough and follow it up. So I have the same okay. issue, right? I have a compacted issue and over the fall, I've had a response of um, tap rooting um, yeah. weeds. And I've also had a whole bunch of kale and brassicas um, come up. So I have to go down there and, and broad fork it and then seed it. So. Okay. So if I were working with a client and they, and we needed to do grading, then I should just plan that second half of the, of the activities to follow the grading. Right. In yeah. In terms of just estimating that project. So make sure we always follow up with broad forking and re amending that soil in some way, whether it's over planting yeah. mm -hmm. or yeah. Okay. So, you know, it, it's, it's tough looking, you know, it's tough to provide advice. Um, but often with new plantings, mm -hmm. uh, it really depends on the space, but often we will be bringing in new soil for that. Right. Because where I mm -hmm. live, our soils are inherently uh, gravelly, sandy. They're, they're not great to start a landscape with, right? So it really depends on the, the, the client and what they want to try and do. But in a small space where we have a, uh, where we've planned to have some plantings, we will, we would most likely go in and excavate out okay. that material and bring in new soil. Now that's not, you could say, well, that's not very permaculture like, and uh yeah you'd be right um it we we need we do that really to give our clients uh sort of an accelerated process right so we can get a, a quickly established landscape rather than spending because <clears throat> it takes time uh you spend quite a few years building that soil up you can mm -hmm. certainly do either one if this is for yourself, uh, it's just like we're, when we work on um, on our property, uh, we take a slightly different approach because we don't necessarily want to have an instant landscape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, and where yeah. you, where you're living on Bainbridge Island, that's 
now you're into a whole different context because I can imagine getting materials like topsoil is hard mm -hmm. and probably expensive too. It's expensive. Yeah. yeah. So going, uh, grading it and broad forking it, and then following that up with compost is probably the, the most cost effective approach and trying to, um, to use plant material that are going to be conducive with, with the, the soil conditions and the setting, okay. right? So when you have okay. new, new topsoil, even though it's actually devoid of life, it gives you a lot of um, opportunity to sort of push the edge of what you can get away with. Yeah. And there's some good questions in the chat too about um, kind of, yeah, I've read about radishes helping to break the daikon radish to help break yeah. up the soil. And then also mm -hmm. doing like over like a cover crop of um, clover. Um, you know, honestly, like it, on an area of this size, yeah. um, although I'm sure it's, you know, it's a good size by the looks of it, uh, but yeah. we're not looking at, at, say, 10 acres. So let's say yeah. it was agricultural setting and you've got a compaction issue over the whole site. Well, you could use um, a different tool like a key line, a key line plow, uh, which we've used before. And it's quite an amazing, quite an amazing tool. Um, let me just show you a picture of it here. It's just a, a kind of a subsoiling plow that um, basically slices uh, into the landscape and decompacts without okay. disturbing, significantly disturbing the surface. Uh, and some even have rollers on the back to push, uh, you know, to, to minimize this trench effect because, uh, you know, a farmer might want to have animals out here pretty quick. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of these also have direct seeding and some of them are applying compost tea. There are all sorts of uh, versions that uh, one can look at. But um, what we do is there is one on Vancouver Island where I live and we just mm -hmm. um, rent it and then contract a, uh, a farmer with a 50 horsepower or greater tractor. And mm -hmm. it's a very fast process provided you don't mm -hmm. have too many rocks or woody debris under the ground. Okay. So that's where, great. I guess where I'm going is yes, plants can really help. But if you want to really jumpstart uh, a, a badly compacted area, manually doing it will just, you know, shoot you ahead by years. <laughs> so okay. it is, it's worth considering. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And so, yeah, Zena, I totally agree with you. Dacon is a wonderful approach to that. Um, and, and yes, yeah, do you just leave the radishes in there? Yeah, yeah. Often okay. that's what people do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you have a nice, uh, you know, if you think about it, um, those radishes are quite good size. And when they decompose, it, there is some resemblance to what's going on here. Okay. Right. You've left a cavity. It's going to allow for air and nutrient uh, to get down a little bit deeper. Hmm. Yeah, and then Stefan, you have a question here. Would this be a good time to plant cover crops for a couple of years? So I guess you're talking about uh, winter? Yeah, now. Yeah. Oh. Specifically with this conversation, like putting in like alfalfa or something like that to like really disrupt the ground. So after it's been disturbed, like well, if, it, if we if within, we go back to that example where we've graded an area. Yeah, I guess if, if that, do you need to grade it before you plant the alfalfa or are you just like, can you just put it on the top and like over the next couple of years, keep planting it? And you mean on existing, um, say existing pasture or vegetation? Specifically with Tabitha's uh, land. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Context. So if we go back to that and that's disturbed already, so that's yeah. easy. Yeah. Right after you have done your work, mm -hmm. say whether it's a machine or by hand, doesn't matter. But once mm -hmm. this is uh, ready to go, mm -hmm. um, and I would say after broad forking in this case, yeah, putting a cover crop on it is a really good idea. And then just trying to get a cover crop that is like at this time of year, uh, winter field pea is a fabulous crop. Okay. It'll germinate and grow in uh, very cool conditions. And then it's super easy to kill, right? All you have to do is cut it. And <laughs> Do uh, I have to kill it? I, <laughs> I, I put down red clover and I couldn't bring myself to turn it into the soil did i just completely yeah. ruin no you don't and i would be careful how you you like with the winter field pea all you have to do is yeah. cut the top and that's okay. it you're gonna kill okay. it uh okay. i wouldn't try and blend it into the soil i would try okay. and minimize disturbance especially after you've you've done all this right Disturb. so you yeah. don't you want to now leave that area to to reassemble itself because all of that soil or all the soil organisms are either, <clears throat> you know, totally disrupted um, mm. where they're not there anymore. So you want to encourage, mm. encourage things to come back. And um, uh, yeah, so do be mindful of that. Now, there's some cover crops, like if you put a fall rye in, you know, you do have to, um, you know, turning that in is traditionally what's done with it. But um, mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of different approaches. I don't like, uh, with cover crops where we live, they're, typically we want to cover our annual vegetable garden. Um, it's the soil is always covered with something. So once we hit, say, the fall, if there's a bed that uh, has just been harvested, we'll put winter field pea down, and then we actually eat the, the tips of the plant all winter. Because mm -hmm. they have, they taste just like peas. Um, they're okay. beautiful, and then as they flower, mm -hmm. we'll go in and cut them down, okay. and then just we basically just leave uh, the material on the ground, um, okay. covering the soil. And then if we were wanting to plant that right away, we could pull that material away, um, and then you have to disturb, you know, slightly. Uh, if you're seeding okay. and then we could just put the material back on. I mean, there's, yeah, huh. there's cool. all kinds of ways of doing it. Okay. So, so Stefan, hopefully that answered your question. Uh, yes. Covering. And let's say you didn't want to cover this with a cover crop. Well, get some hay or straw or something on it. I, I wouldn't recommend uh, hay because you could get uh, you could germination out of that, but some straw, um okay. something to cover the soil surface is that to prevent erosion yeah and compaction right mm -hmm. so if we have if we have bare soil during rain events uh those raindrops are <laughs> doing a lot of harm so we want to okay. try and minimize that so compost mulch straw or vegetation uh are, are ways we want to go Okay. Yeah. I'm glad I can offer this learning experience for everyone. Oh, <laughs> Don't yeah. do what I did. Well, <laughs> I, that's I mean, actually, this is like year two of it being cleared like this. Um, so if you'll yeah, find if you decompact that. that, if you find yourself a broad fork, uh, okay. all of a sudden that whole area is going to behave a little bit differently. Okay. Um, your water's going to, the hydrology is going to change slightly and um, mm -hmm. you should have and if you're not ready to do anything with it, just, you know, even throwing wood chips or some sort of mulch down uh, is a great in-between. But I, I don't think you want to ignore the compaction. So I, I would definitely uh, prioritize that. But um, okay, that Thank is you. my opinion. So, yeah, so that was a good question, Stefan. Thank you for that. Uh, Nancy's got a question here. So you watched a video about fungi being the basis of climax ecosystem. Yeah. Should you refrain from 
spraying your stone fruit trees with fungicide? Well, my personal opinion would be yes. Uh, if I do not spray, you get peach leaf curl. Yeah, and I'm not a fruit tree specialist, I'll say that. Um, I know there are some uh, peach leaf curl resistant plants. That doesn't help you if you have one already. Uh, it, the one thing I would do, so so with your orchard, do you have grass growing right up to the base of the tree? Yeah. Okay. So that's something you could change. And that would make a profound difference right there. So if you do like a, a, a circle around the tree and depending on the size of the tree, um, maybe you want to be three or four or five feet off of the stem and you just, that area around the tree, you want to try and shift it from being turf to something else or even nothing right so if you had if you if you threw down a bunch of um cardboard and put bark malt not bark malt uh wood chips on top of the cardboard just to snuff out the grass you're going to find that your tree uh, trees will um most likely enjoy that now it's kind of funny because grass and trees they're what they want in terms of the bacterial bacteria to fungal ratios because that's really what it's about when we disturb soil uh like tabitha had, had here we're going to kill off a lot of that uh fungal the the fungal organisms don't like disturbance so they're going to get eliminated or set back so your your soils will become bacterial dominant and trees want to be more on the fungal side. So if we're if we can remove and encourage um, the areas around these trees to shift more fungal, you you probably find you have less uh, healthier trees are going to be more resistant to the peach leaf curl. And of course, the weather does play into that. Uh, we have quite a large almond on our property, a Hall's Hardy almond, and it gets leaf curl on it um, every year. But then it, it those leaves drop and that's it, right? It's looking healthy the rest of the year. So I'm sure that might be similar to your situation. It's a, a cool spring or an early growing season issue, and then it grows out of it, so to speak. So just a question of reducing that a little bit and making the, the soil around it more healthy. That's kind of how I would um, approach it rather than fungicide. And the fungicide, are, it's harmful, depending on what you're using, um, you know, it's going to be harmful for yourself. So, you know, kind of want to mm -hmm. weigh all that out. Yeah. Jamie, does that mean in terms of succession, I want to reverse succession it, by this with, with with the stone fruits in the orchard? Is is that conceptually what I need to do? Uh, well, you're probably going the other direction, aren't you? If you're in a pasture setting or a or a, a turf setting, and you're trying to grow trees, those are they have two different ideals so if you have beautiful pasture and the trees are struggling a little bit maybe that may be one reason so that's where the soil food web test is helpful that they will look at a sample and go oh okay you're trying to grow um say you're growing peach or uh, another um prunus uh, species uh if you're, you're growing these uh, you need a little more fungal uh, content in your soil. Ideally, uh, they'll give you some some tips on how you can try and boost that up. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the succession's a big part when you're. It's it's tricky to grow. So, just as an example, we're 
where we live, we have we do no till annual vegetables. Um, we grow ninety five percent of our own veggies, and over the years with no till, it's been less and less disturbance. And we found things like brassicas, uh, like kale, for instance, kohlrabi. Uh, those plants like early succession. So as these beds get more and more established, they have a higher and higher fungal content. And it's actually not great when it comes to those types of plants. So we have to create a little bit of disturbance. And uh, there's some great tools um, specifically for annual vegetables. Oh gosh, I'm trying to add the name in my... There we go, Tilther. These are wonderful. Uh, I don't have one. I it's on my wish list, but um, it's basically uh, rototilling an inch, the top inch of the soil. It makes a beautiful seed bed. Makes it really easy for easier for market gardeners to incorporate compost. Uh, leaves a really nice finish, but it doesn't turn over the whole bed. It's just that top inch. So that's worth checking out. And uh, there's a few types of this uh, out there, but you have to be really into vegetables and, uh, and growing quite a bit to justify <laughs> the cost of it. But um, that's one approach. Yeah, so Stefan had a Another question, thank you so much. Good head out. Okay. Yeah. Well, good to see you, Stefan. And sorry again for the late start today. Um, is there any other questions anybody would like to cover today? Got a few minutes left here. Um, I put more in our document. Uh huh. All um, right. But it's, I don't want to, again, dominate all the time here. Oh, I can, okay. It's at the bottom. So what I'm going to do, I'll put it at the top because that's. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, no worries. It's kind of done in reverse order here. Okay. Just so I can see it. There we go. And so some of those. Yeah, we, can, we, we can go through this. Question. Okay. So what we, you mean? answered, yeah, the first few yeah, so that uh, is all to do with uh, with clay. And sometimes you'll have a floating, uh, you'll have debris floating on the surface, and that's organic matter, of course. That has nothing to do with the texture. Mm -hmm. um, so improving clay soil with invasive deep-rooted weeds and other burdock. So I you're hope hope that. you hope... You're hoping to improve your soil with invasives? Is that what you're? No, <laughs> I'm, 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 it's it's what we were just talking about, how okay. to improve that. I thought it was clay, but it sounds like it's compaction. Right. Um, so I've got a plan for that now. Um, and then just adjacent to that area that you saw in the picture, if you keep going to the corners, the lowest point of the property, and that is, eh, it's probably disturbed as well. I think that's on another slide there nope not that or maybe i picked one different no okay so ignore the other two so very similar soil though to that backyard cleared area but it's mm -hmm. where the rain garden is currently it's the lowest point of my property ah. and the water does not drain um huh. well it does it does eventually so we dug a hole with the idea of it being our, our uh, lowest point to catch the water yeah and let it perk over time. It does eventually get there. I don't know how it's doing it because it seems very, um, the perk test itself was very slow to drain. So, so if should you... I be doing anything else back there? Well, if you had access to, to this, you could okay. run, run a quick compaction test. Now, if you don't have one of these, what you could do is take a fork, right? If, mm -hmm. um, whatever fork you have and just go and push it into the soil mm -hmm. and 
you know, it's very inaccurate, but it, you'll get a feel for whether this is easy or whether you have to literally jump on it to get it into the ground. And that's going to tell you right there. So if you have a rain garden, that's say on top of a, a compacted area, that, mm -hmm. that would certainly um, inhibit infiltration there. Could Should be your soil I texture. Abandon? So in that situation, do I abandon the rain garden and try and move it further up where I have good draining mm. soil? No, or you do I might. Or the base of the garden? No. Uh, did you build the rain garden? By build it, we dug a hole in the ground, yes. Okay. No, oh, that's good. <laughs> it Cause... was really weird. The soil was so bizarre. It like um would um roll when you walked on it, like a... Uh, it was holding so much water right underneath yeah. the surface. It was really interesting. Yeah, it maybe a case um, uh, without knowing it uh, intimately, uh, it may be a case where that's not the most appropriate spot for a rain garden because you may be getting some groundwater um, that naturally wants to be there. So if, if you dug a hole, like you were saying, you dug a perk test and the water's just holding in there, uh -huh. uh, you know, it could be compaction, but it could also represent uh, groundwater in that area. So yeah. that's one of the things. If you, well, let me just see. If you take a look at this handbook, and I will put the okay, that's it. Go back. I'll just uh, put this link into the chat. This is a great resource. And if you take a look at that resource, you will see their <clears throat> first steps for rain garden uh, consideration is testing the area. Yeah. So before you, when, when you dug that hole, was it with a machine? Yes. And then was there water in there? When we removed the soil? Yeah. Yeah. Um, or, yeah. Or... So what's happening is the, uh, the drain pipe from the downspouts goes all the way to the very back of the yard. So it's opening up right into that area. I see. Well, that should be okay if you have the right soils. Like I have um, driveway drain, house perimeter, roof water. Like once we finish collecting rainwater, all of our excess storm water and ditch water go into a huge rain garden. And it just it'll take almost anything I can throw at it. But then I have, um, you know, sandy loam. So very, very sharp drainage. And it's at the top of a slope. So it oh. naturally is heading away from uh, the house and all the living areas around the house. Um, so in your situation, you may have a little bit of a low spot it's that, the lowest um, point on the property. Yeah, that accumulates. And there may, do you think there's uh, maybe nowhere for that water to go? So it's kind of the right. end of the... Yeah, because it's not, it's, uh, and then it levels out towards the neighbor. So I thought it was a good place to catch and slow that water. I don't have a great, um, my aquifer is low producing. Mm. Um, that's where I had to put a governor on my new well pump. Mm -hmm. to not yeah. over pump from the aquifer so yeah. i that was kind of another question is when you can catch water on your property am i charging the aquifer that i'm sitting on top of or uh when you're else happening with a rain garden do you mean yeah like yeah yeah, yeah. With any water that i can catch and then slow yes on the property well I... that's um <laughs> that's not an easy question to answer other than you are more likely to, uh, you're more likely to get uh, benefit in your aquifer by slowing down water as it's going across your site. It's, it's a pretty um, complex and diverse uh, 
topic, just knowing where and how water travels. So you might figure out in one area how that is. Um, like we, we have little springs pop up on our property seasonally. And, mm -hmm. you know, is there an easy explanation for that? Yeah, it, it, I think it's just various layers of subsoil. And like if we have hard pan as well, where we live, mm -hmm. uh, if you go down deep enough, so that's impervious. So once water right. hits that, it starts to slide. Uh huh. Right. Um, and it's always going to go for the easiest, lowest. You know, it's gravity um, mm -hmm. is is working on it all at all times. So if you have a low producing aquifer, then trying to infiltrate in and around that is a great idea, provided it's not putting your structure at risk right so yeah. that's something we've been contemplating uh is actually creating a huge rain garden around or or close to our wellhead yeah uh, me too how yeah. close are you trying to go um i I'd, I'd be happy if i was you know say 30 to 50 feet away in our situation. Okay. Uh, I, I don't really have to do it because our, our well is really good producing, but we're just getting like our neighbor ran out of water this summer and I want to be proactive. So we actually have a well meter that we're getting so we can see what the static water level is at all times. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I'm considering the rain, rain garden to to just augment. Uh, you just yep. have to be careful what kind of water you're putting <laughs> in there, right? You wouldn't want to put storm water that could have hydrocarbons in it. Okay. Um, but for us, it'd be kind of redirecting a spring. So that's pretty okay. safe. Yeah. Let's go back to your questions because we should wrap up here fairly soon. <laughs> Um, so yeah, maybe if you want to continue with this discussion, Tabitha, maybe for the next meeting, mm -hmm. um, if you want to get some photos and sort of even identify on your base plan where this, this yeah. spot is, we can kind of look at that further. Okay. Um, rain gardens are great ideas, but there is the occasion where they're not the best um, for a specific spot here. Uh, let's see, you want help with pests. Yeah, and you know, it's funny, we've never had any uh, significant pest issues. And one of the reasons is, is we're trying to encourage everything, right? So whether it's pollinators or, yeah. you know, we get aphids, we get you know, ants are uh, trying to um, uh, encourage them and protect them. We get all sorts of a uh, wide variety of insects, but we also get a lot of wasps and um, they're super helpful. If you have flea beetles and they're going after your crops, you can get um, insect netting for, um, for row crops, right? So oh. that's something to look for. I know a lot of market gardeners have to do that. Okay. Um, so they're they're, they're specific. Awful. They're yeah. tiny. I mean, they're so yeah. tiny. They're like the head of a pin. Yeah, but they're pretty destructive. Um, yeah, and root weevils. Wait, fly. Yeah. So. <clears throat> You know, one approach to that, instead of um, going after the pest, is to encourage its uh, predator. And not by importing it, but by just creating as much diversity as possible. So if we look at this picture, right, and I, I'm not going to to be critical or anything like that, uh, and let's say we are these, uh, is this a little orchard, an older orchard that's here? Or yeah, I've old? got a, 
Okay. Yeah, I've got an established um, peach and two apples. Cool. So if you if if, if we took this area as an example, uh, and you could incorporate more vegetation uh, while okay. still allowing for harvest, right? Yeah. Um, you would find that that's increased habitat for some of the the predators that are going to go after um, okay. the, the the pests you don't want, and even woody debris. Um, uh, like we will purposely lay down old rotten logs around, like say underneath this conifer here. It looks like a conifer. Uh, yeah. If you had a bunch of woody. Now you got to be careful with that because you don't want to create hazards, fire hazards. Um, okay. But just undisturbed habitat. So okay. the the slide eighty five and eighty six show where the beds are. It's specifically in my raised beds. Oh yeah. That it's uh, I got some grief. So you do you're right on the edge of forest here, so that's great. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you're you're. So maybe even putting some, making sure you do have some woody debris along there. And okay. then, uh, you know, our annual vegetables are surrounded by um, some ornamentals and some perennial vegetables. So okay. that I think is also really helpful. You just okay. try and get as much diversity going uh, in in sort of undisturbed areas, so you plant, you mulch, and you don't go back in and and um, disturb. If that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I kept all the cuttings on the soil this year. Um, I'm not removing them. I'm hopefully encouraging more beneficial pests to come in. Yeah. Over winter. Well, good for you. It's a long, you know, it's not a quick um, fix. I mean, when we moved where we are, it was basically a, a desert. Um, you know, we had no soil. So it's take it takes years. Yeah. Years to build it all up. So I have a question here about ash. Yeah, ash from your wood stove. Um, I would find ash from your wood stove uh, is great for soap making. Uh, there's a lot <laughs> of interesting videos about that. Okay. Um, it's not... You can, biochar is very uh, interesting, usable product. Uh, making it yourself is totally doable. Uh, it is quite expensive to buy, but it typically doesn't come out of a wood stove. Um, right. So I'd be careful with what you do with ash. I wouldn't, like for instance, if you put it into compost, you don't want to have more than 5% of your compost uh, okay. have ash content in it because it's, yeah. Okay. So hopefully that helps you there. And do you have to dig to start a who? That, yes, that's what I do. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So we dig out. <clears throat> I don't have images uh, handy right now, but I can get them for next meeting. But we will dig a, a We'll probably take out a foot of material below the finished grade. So if it's okay. a big, a big, uh, wide mound we want to make, we'll do that. We'll throw, and then we'll throw our woody debris in, and then okay. put that topsoil back on top. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm lazy, so I was hoping I could just start. Well, you can tossing you can, limbs on the ground. The nice thing about having it in the ground a bit is it yeah. will be moist during the winter and yeah. you know you want to get that sponge effect going yeah get it to break down yeah and i'm sure where you are you have lots of woody debris that you can access yes. i would imagine so lots cool okay thanks for answering all my questions yeah Appreciate no all problem that time. no problem and uh thank you very much everybody for your patience today um we will call it a day with our meeting here and i look forward to seeing your your lesson six assignments next week and again for those who handed in uh lesson five assignments over the break i'll be taking a look at those shortly but uh yeah everybody have a, a great week and if you have any trouble with 
uh, your assignment, drop me a note and we'll see what we can do to help you out. Okay. So take care, everybody.